All right. Welcome back to Tuesday Morning Pastor's Corner. This is episode three of our roundtable discussion on biblical masculinity. Last time we looked at the creation account from Genesis 1 and 2 and made some observations about masculinity as God uh, indicated in uh, the, about our differences between Adam and Eve, men and women. We talked about the biological differences, the social dif the, the, the the soul differences, sorry, the soul differences about how people think and how people uh, are innate. Uh, responsibility, authority, but also understanding that authority comes from God and all authority is under authority until you get to God. So man's authority is not absolute. It is under authority. Um, and that uh, that authority and responsibility over Eve is not great. It's it's There's a partnership there, but there has to be some level of responsibility and level of authority. We talked about the family role within Genesis 1 and 1 and, 1 and 2 and also leadership that uh, Adam was uh, was given that responsibility. I think in, in I, one of the aspects we talked about was in the naming of the animals and that he was given that, that leadership responsibility. And I also found it interesting, that I just want to kind of point it out, that in chapter three, he also names the woman. So I, 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 we've talked about that before, and I don't want to make a small point, that naming gives a level of responsibility and an authority over uh, over something. So uh, I, I do think that there is a level of authority over the Adam had over Eve. But again, I think that continuity and um, relationship and um, co-functioning as one flesh is the primary, um, primary impetus of chapter two. Do you All think right. the, the significance of that naming has something to do or the, the interesting placement of that after the fall has any major significance? Um, uh, yeah, I do. Uh, but we'll, th we'll get to that. Let's go ahead and talk about that a little bit. <clears throat> I don't want to get into all the weeds about um, the, the entire situation with the serpent. I want to pick it up. And just basically, we know the story that um, God gave a law. Um, don't eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Eve is deceived. Adam rebelled. They sinned and sin entered creation. So First question, uh, kind of taken from, uh, again, Brad's information here, and, and, and it's kind of more of an open-ended question, trying to, to kind of consolidate some of the ideas here. Did Adam fail Eve? Is that, is that something that we can imply from the text? Because it's like one of the things that, that, that's I, intriguing to me, because this is something I've taught, something I've kind of implied, something I've heard other people say. The text doesn't say that directly anywhere, that Adam failed Eve. However, this is something that we all kind of hold to. Um, do we, uh, can we, can we get some discussion on that and kind of explain our points of view? Well, I, I absolutely think he failed. One, he did not, he did not assert his authority over the creation. A serpent, I, I don't care whether it was possessed or not, still was a created being. Uh, I guess my first response would have been if I'd been standing there, well, obviously it wouldn't have been because I'm in Adam, but in retrospect, a response might have been to tell the servant, take a hike. I have authority over you. It was given to me. You, you need to take a hike. You need to be gone. And he didn't, he didn't protect his wife. He should have stepped in at that point and reminded her, had she forgotten, that God's command was, and at least made effort to protect her, whether she would have followed the leadership, the protection, again, as we've talked before, uh, that's something that I think left to be known. But yeah, I think he failed, horribly failed his wife. Uh, the same as I would feel that I would fail if, if, if I saw one seeking to harm my wife and just idly stand by and watch him beat the living tar out of her, uh, I think you would say, Carl, you failed. And he just sat back and watched the serpent beat the living tar out of his wife, if you will, and did nothing. So, yeah, I think he failed. Yeah. Jacob? Yeah, I would agree with that. And, you know, that speaks to, you know, he uses the imagery kind of of a physical failure, but very much the spiritual failure of allowing the words of Satan to, to sow those seeds in Eve's mind and, and, Based on the context, it appears his mind as well. It seems like he's there, perhaps listening. You know, how much of the conversation we're not told, but when it says she also gave to her husband, it seems to imply that, you know, she didn't have to go anywhere to give it to him. 
he's there. And so the failure to stop the problem, nip it in the bud and say, no, you are questioning the word of God, the authority of God, and we won't do it. And, you know, we can, in hindsight, deal with all these things, but that's also not how temptation works, right? When we're outside of temptation, we can say, I'll do this or I won't do that. But in the heat of the moment, and especially as Satan knows us, is appealing to the very things that, you know, we are, are weak points. And I think they both so came to that. And I think Adam, in my mind, holds the guilt. Both are guilty, but I, I view Adam as the responsible party. Brad, it looked like you wanted to, to chime in there a little bit. Yeah, I, I, I just loved that the, I just loved the word "succumb." It was so it's beautiful. Sick. It was kind of a well, kind of a past, past perfect usage of "succumb." I, I'm just pox like, legomena. Paul makes up words and that's right. Have the same and I'm privilege. so glad that you did because I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that it's a it's a really important point to take because it's fascinating that you can have a misogynistic reading as as the, much of church history has right of Genesis three, where you're looking at it and Eve is the problem and Eve caused the fall and Eve. Eve was the one who sinned, and I think moving forward in our growth and understanding of what Scripture is teaching, right, uh, has brought us to this interesting place where we have the opportunity to take responsibility, at least to say that the fall was a human problem, but even to point out that if man is indeed given any kind of responsibility or husband over wife or whatever it is, then we have to recognize that Adam is the prime mover. Adam is the problem in this situation. Uh, and uh, while I don't believe that the purpose that we're given this text is simply to make modern day applications, it's actually describing a historical fact that uh, that obviously affects us all, that changed the whole story. I would absolutely say that we have the ability to repeat this folly constantly as men and not take responsibility uh, for our failures to our wives and say, oh, well, it's your fault, honey. It's your fault. So it's, it's, it's not that that's the uh, hidden meaning or the interpretation of the text. It's just that we have a tendency to repeat that pattern of, uh, of, of essentially abdicating our leadership role and failing, you know, our wives continually. And so I think we can say that that is a, an, a, an easy an easy observation that, you know, kind of what we did then, we, we still do now, or at least have the temptation and potential to do now. I think my question comes off of that. Did Adam fail Eve? I think Adam failed God, correct? I mean, that's that was the first stop. He, he was given directive by God, whether he was told to pass it on or not. Um, his re direct responsibility was to God first which would have made it easy to be responsible to take care of Eve. Uh, in 1 Timothy, it talks about Adam being created first, then Eve. So there's a responsibility given to Adam as the first man because he was first up. He was there first. He, he, he was given directives by God. He had named the animals. He had, he, had, he had been told by God it's not good for man to be alone. And whether we as a group agree that Adam was hanging out with Eve when she was talking with Satan or not, he, he had some culpability because he was in close proximity to take the fruit and not say, Hey, what are you doing? Haven't we had a directive by God that I have either not given to you, or at least I know of, and we need to stop here, right here, stop the conversation. He didn't do any of that. So I think there's a duality of responsibility there first and foremost to God, and secondly, to protect his wife. Um, and, he, and it says, she was deceived. Well, what was, you know, in Timothy, it says, for Adam was not, de was not deceived, but the woman being quite deceived, which is kind of interesting, because sometimes when they add words, I said, did they really need to add a word quite deceived versus deceived? And I think, yes, it had to be a, a put there. But I think... I think Adam holds the responsibility. This is where the buck should have stopped, and it di and didn't. And and I and I really, I think my angst is we don't teach men that their priority first of all is to God. We want to make them good workers, good husbands. We want to we want to make them, um, you know, certain leadership roles that they should have. We want to do all those things for men, but we fail to teach them focus on God first. God's got to be first. 
I really think that helps straighten out the rest of things if you see this is God's directives, you know? So. And I agree. Um, it's one of the things that, that kind of come to mind is that God, that, that, that sorry, that Adam failed Eve, sinned against God. So like the, the failure to her, to his wife was, I think, pretty clear. That there's something missing in this entire situation about Adam's, Adam's uh, um, involvement with this conversation, and it's not there. But he, the sin, the rebellion, was against God, and that's where the and that's where it kind of enters in. I don't want to get into a harmatology question dealing with you know the study of sin and whatnot because you know there's a lot of different questions about exactly what the sin was, and obviously it's the eating of the fruit. The failure is not the question. But I think it's clear. Well, um, I, I want to interrupt for something real quick. Sure. I, and, and I don't want to do this much today, but I'm I'm just thinking again, as we as as we look at this, you said something about silence and should we fill in the, the blanks? And sometimes it's good to fill in the blanks, and sometimes the blanks are there because it's not it's not a not an issue. It's not it's not the point of the story. Right, right. But in this case, um, we have enough information from other parts of scripture to say the buck stopped with adam which i've already said i don't want to be overly redundant um or just redundant um but as we look at this i think it's important for us to see um it began at cre the creation narrative began with a delineation of what adam was what he was to do why he was a special creation and therefore he was formed out of the dust of the earth he was formed out of the ground god did that, you know, kind of thing. And then he put him to sleep and took out of him woman. So God was the master designer, master former, everything. Um, but Adam was the creation that Eve came from. And I think with that being said, that fills the silence to say there is a direct responsibility. And I and I'm gonna be honest, you said that he the sin was eating the fruit. I think the sin was rebellion against God. God had told him something directly. God gave him two things to do. Two. You know, sometimes you give your kid one thing to do and it can't handle one, you know. But God gave his child two things to do and he did neither of them first. So I, well, I might add one more thing be, before perhaps lead, lead this area. And uh -huh. that is, I, I hold Adam more accountable because Eve was deceived. Adam made a direct volitional decision in his mind, apart from any deception, to disobey God. Uh, and I, I mean, I, again, being deceived doesn't let, let anyone off the hook. But I, I think it takes the responsibility on Adam, uh, a heavier responsibility. Uh, so I, I, really, I really lay the, the, the fall at the feet of Adam, not at Eve. Yeah, and in fact, that's actually one of the next questions. Since um, we've already, that's it, it's part of it is: is there a gender difference with Adam and Eve in regard to eating of the fruit? The is is there was there something different for Adam and the culpability for eating of the fruit than there was different for Eve in the in the culpability? And kind of related to that is: does this also relate to the ultimate responsibility to God in regard to the family? Is there something to be learned here in this situation that Moses is retelling from a historical account that is supposed to be related to how a family unit is supposed to function? So, you know, it's it's kind of like where my mind went when I was rereading this information and kind of going over the booklet a little bit and saying, is there a lesson to be learned for us in general? Husbands and wives. In dealing with this, the culpability over who sinned and who was deceived. Do we, anybody want to chime in on that? Does anybody want to uh, like? Is there? Am I am I off base here? That there's that it displayed in this situation that there is an ultimate responsibility between Adam and Eve. I don't know. Well, I, would, I would agree with you, and I think I, I've stated what mine is, and so uh, I'll let Brad speak up from here. But yeah, you know, I. I, I think there is well, and I think it's Adams. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'd use the word ultimate responsibility only because it might in, might suggest that women are not responsible to not be deceived. 
right? And obviously they that's that's going too far. But the the final, and this is what I'm sure you mean by ultimate, the final responsibility to bring truth into the marriage relationship is absolutely a sign of biblical masculinity. And I think that's kind of the point of what I hope we're getting at is if we can rescue the concept of masculinity from the world's ideas, uh, good, bad, or otherwise, right? Uh, because it, again, the world will always focus on a masculinity that is based around um, certain actions, right? Or attitudes or behaviors or styles, you know, like uh, you know, violence or whatever it is. Uh, and hopefully we can replace that with a true biblical perspective to know you you are biblically doing what you're meant to be doing as you bring the truth of the word of God into your marriage and as you defend your marriage or your family from lies. That is the part of the man's responsibility. It's funny, we always focus on really stupid things like physical protection, which, you know, or whatever, which is fine. I, I guess that's a part of it. But, you know, it seems like the innocent as doves part of, of, of much of Christianity was to be martyred, right? They didn't protect their families. They allowed them to be martyred for the faith. I mean, it's not that they were volunteering, but the more important you know, uh, focus is to protect your 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 family from deception, from satanic deception. Protecting your family physically seems like a distant second in light of eternity in terms of what the purpose and function of masculinity is. Yeah, because in, 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 the, in the account, we know it can jump ahead briefly and say God holds both accountable, no doubt. The, what, the, the woman is not off the hook. It's not like, okay, husband, now you take care of your wife. And 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 no, God holds her responsible and lays down a curse upon her as well. However, I do think that the the curse upon the man, and not only upon the man, but it, it's 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 it demonstrates a higher accountability, because I do believe the curse is to be is a little bit more poignant, say less. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, I, I want to read verse 8. Um, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Um, the Lord God said to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, and I was naked. Now, the reason I'm, I'm, asked, I'm reading that particular passage is because I think I've mentioned this before, and I'm curious as to what you all think, and I do have a point to this dealing with masculinity. Is this a Christophany? Not just a theophany, but is this a Christophany? Is this the second person of the Trinity? It seems, it seems like a reasonable uh, reasonable assumption based upon the uh, things that are going on, right? The Lord hovering as a spirit is a an odd picture because, again, the word walk is used. It's not as if there weren't other words used. And additionally, this calling out to where are you? I mean, if he was, again, a disembodied or, or appearing as a disembodied spirit or a light or a water jug or whatever else it is, then those uh, those terms make very little sense. However, uh, a voice emanating from a body and, and I think it's very reasonable to assume it's it's the pre-incarnate Christ. Uh, and, and, you know, where are you and come out, right? Those terms all of a sudden have meaning versus the idea of, of, of hiding from, you know, a ghost or a spirit or some disembodied, you know, presence seems unreasonable. And additionally, I would argue that that uh, gives more understand, deeper understanding of what it means to be created in the image of God, that that's not exclusively an emotional theological reality but it is also has some physical. sense of physical reality that we're modeled after christ so for all those reasons and i wouldn't you know like go to the mattresses and tell someone they're a heretic if they didn't think that was the case uh but i i think it is a very reasonable thought given the content of of scripture does anyone uh have a uh, rebuttal against that? I mean, because I, I, I want to have that as a premise a little bit to the next question. I have an addition if it's valuable here, but I always like to think about the historical context. And so just a brief summary of how I see the context, Moses is the writer and he's writing to who I believe is the wilderness surviving generation about to enter the land. And so that generation, they already have more or less this information through oral tradition. Maybe there's some details that they don't have, but perhaps they're familiar with the events that we see later in Genesis of, you know, one, one of my favorites that I covered recently is 
uh, the two lords issue in the Sodom and Gomorrah investigation seems to imply, again, Trinity. So with that and piecing together what we understand about Genesis's purpose in essentially introducing or better acquainting the nation of Israel with who their creator is, you know, we start to see some major things about God in his character, his attributes, all the, his plan, his program, these sort of things. And so I, I would certainly be willing to look at this passage and fully allow that this is a Christophany, but to Brad's point, you know, I'm not going to be dogmatic yeah. and fight. I, I think that we can go ahead and, and, and at least have a, just a kind of a, a semblance of just taking that for granted. Okay. Again, not, not, not a hill we're rolling down, but taking that for granted, this is a Christophany. I found that interesting because going back to the original, uh, the first uh, lesson, Christ being the ultimate man. Now, in his humanity, it displays that perfectly. But in a Christophany, I kind of, I, my, this is where my mind went on doing this particular research. Does this give an example or something we can model ourselves after in dealing with masculinity about what the perfect man does in response to the first act of rebellion? And so, Here's what I wrote. That's so how I want to go ahead and get your comments on this. A direct confrontation of sin, seeking those who fail, and then justice with mercy. That that wasn't just God, but Jesus in a, in a Christophany displaying proper humanity, proper masculinity, and how he dealt with the situation and not simply just threw his hands up and, and left them to their own, uh, own uh, resources, uh, own uh, consequences well i would say you, you, you know you know how i break things in, in my p boxes I, I would certainly think it's possible and, and, and probably probable that it was but i would think i would say to your point whether it was a christophany or not your point is well taken in, in either case relative to male masculinity what a man because a man we were creating god's example even even if this was and I don't think it was just simply a voice. But even if it was, your point is still valid in, uh, re regardless. And I think it's a, it's a well thought out point and, and one that I'm going to be scribbling down in a moment. And I hope it's just broadcast and men listen to it. They'll back up. And I'm going to ask you to restate that point because I think it is a valid one and it is a good one for male masculinity. Well, to restate it then is the direct confrontation of sin, seeking those who fail, and then displaying justice with mercy. I think that's I think that's the picture. I, I again that's just knowing also that this is characteristics that we see throughout the rest of scripture. That this is how that they're that how governments are supposed to run, how families are supposed to run, and the, the examples of God throughout all of history is that in giving us the mind of Christ. And this is part of it. And now, again, there's more, of course. This isn't exclusive, but there's, it seems to be a very strong point here that God sought out, Christ sought out those who failed. And he, made the, he made the first contact. Well, so, and to that point, I would add, he doesn't just treat the symptoms either. He gets to the disease that Satan sought to question his authority. And the very next thing we see is his authority stands. And, and we see that applied in this situation how you said with wisdom mercy care but but seriousness as well for what what's been done so the next question then uh, comes from verse 16 of i said from 17 through 19 and dealing with the curses what does the curse tell us about the difference between men and women so do we understand the the difference in masculinity, the difference in femininity, um, which is harder to say than it should be, right? Femininity, uh, femininity, uh, uh, and say girly. Of, I think that's the accepted yeah, nomenclature. More girly, yeah. Um, and the and the curse. Obviously, we could do the the Genesis three fifteen, but I just want to talk about the the difference between the masculinity and the femininity, or the girliness. I still can't believe that there's a running back named Gurley. That's just funny to me. Um, it's, like, that. it's the boy and, named Sue, right? Like, it's yeah, how you exactly. get so tough. 
and and just ask you know what what observations can we make in the curse about the difference between men and women and specifically how do we define biblical masculinity from the curse i love where you're going with this because it's such a powerful and poignant thing when it comes to the results of sin in eve it is strife in the marital relationship and an unwillingness to accept her husband's authority and uh because of mistrust because of because of because of uh and then uh pain in reproduction showing that core identification of femininity with all of the characteristics of you know, perpetuation of the species and motherhood and that uh, that thing. So it, it it does that for us, right? It it defines femininity in regard to that responsive, caring, uh, part important part of the human thing experience. And then when it comes to Adam, it doesn't uh, you know he doesn't talk about like ED or something. He talks about uh, a, a negative effect on his prof- his life bringing forth food from the earth right so it's interesting that her the curse as it relates to uh to eve is is the family impact which obviously impacts men but then when it comes to adam the primary focus is on bringing forth the productivity or maybe we could say keeping his uh his god's command to be a steward of the earth right so now all of a sudden um we've got thorns and thistles and and difficulty in that regard so i think we do see in that that sense uh, a sort of like hey here's what here's what matters to you eve the family and the child rearing bearing and rearing thing is going to become difficult here's what matters to you adam it's going to be tough to get the work done to feed that family to care for that family kind of being the outward face so i think we can really safely draw that as an implication of what god designed the different functions and focuses of masculinity and femininity to be just based upon how he is explaining sins and and uh, impact upon what we were meant to be doing. Eric, would you like to comment on this? I got lots of comments. Um, You know, it's important for us, again, as we're looking at this total subject of masculinity, um, to not overthink um what where we're at physically in other words um here's what i want to be when i grow up kind of idea remember that when you were a kid what do you want to be and all we looked at was what we would consider masculine roles and i think that's that tended to way some of us would interpret scripture i again god's not looking on anything but the internal um I, I I know this is going to sound really like, where did this come from? But it, I've been working on this, and I think it's interesting. They the Jewish leadership didn't want to defile themselves by going to the court of Pilate during the the trials. Um, but Jesus had already spoken, uh, probably within a year. Of that what really defiled the man? It's not what goes into his mouth, you know, where he was and what he ate. It was came out of the man. And again, I, I think we need to understand that the internal adjustment needs to be made to who God is. I know it's redundant in a different fashion, but if we don't deal with the spiritual part of a guy, um, I think the word masculine is, is a misnomer. I know we say goofy things. Can you find the word masculine in the Bible kind of idea? Um but I think we overemphasize the machoism, not the masculinity. And maybe I'm missing right. that. Um, biblically, it has nothing to do with anything, but what's inside of you should come out at some point. And it does in its term of leadership and fatherhood and your work environment and who you are um, should come out of that. Um, I, I don't know. And, and I was what I was doing when, when I was out of the picture I have a bunch of books down here. I want somebody to define biblically the word masculinity because I don't know if it's a really a biblical word that we're looking for. It, we're looking at the ideal man. Maybe I'm wrong. And again, maybe my understanding of the word masculinity um, is, is more machoism, you know, but 
Yeah, Carl. Well, it, you know, you know, Eric, let me offer that. I don't think I don't think you can do, and I work with very different issues, as you know. I don't think you can define uh, the word masculinity from scripture. I think the very best we can do from the scripture is observe attributes that appear that appear to be proper masculinity. Let, let me add one that I think it it, it comes from Genesis. And, and, that, and that is almost the reverse of what Jesus said about what comes out of your heart. It's also what doesn't come out of your heart. See, it, it, in, in the case of Adam, again, here the command was given to him. Okay, he's the one who had the command. He was the one who was given, from my perspective, the you know, responsible uh, spiritual leadership. Uh, he was the one to do so, I think, by word. I think he was to do so by example. Uh, he was to provide spiritual protection. And he sat there passively and he kept his mouth shut and, and did nothing. Uh, to So when I look at, mascul look at masculinity, from, at least from that, that particular perspective, there, it should be something that comes forth. And what should come forth from the man, one is knowledge of the word. It, 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 he didn't re Why didn't he reiterate to Eve? Remember what God had commanded me, and perhaps not. Maybe his command wasn't direct to her. I don't. I don't think it was. I think the command was to him, and it was to, he was to communicate that command to Eve. Uh, why didn't that come forth? So I, I think sometimes you, you, when you, it's. I think it's going to be very difficult to get a full orb picture, to try and define masculinity. I think you, you look for pieces here and a piece there and, and, and say, at, at times, masculinity is keeping your mouth shut. At times, masculinity is opening your mouth up. And you have to have the sensitivity uh, to the situation and put that situation relative to what you know about the Word of God today. I think the biggest failure in, in Christian men today, the heck with the world, the biggest failure in Christian men today is their lack of knowledge of the word of truth. Because they don't know the word of truth, they don't know how to respond to situations. And they really, we have, and this, this is just an observation from 47 years of pastoring. What I have seen is that men have acquiesced their spiritual role and their spiritual responsibilities to their wives. And walked away, and pretty much walked away from it and left it up to them. And I think that's in part why we see so much of uh, you know, unhealthy masculinity uh, among Christian men today. And with that, I'll shut up for a while. Well, to that, well, Carl, a quick point. You know, I before moving to Denver, we were involved in a ministry in rural Nebraska. And what we heard time and time again from rural pastors is the issue that they had finding leadership because the women kind of ran everything. And it might not just be a rural thing, but men were not stepping up. And so women did. And that often caused some problems when leadership did come and they didn't want to <laughs> hand over the, the reins, if you will. Jacob, let me say this so we don't just pin it on rural men. I have pastored my entire 47 years in metropolitan areas. Same truth. So... In an effort to define masculinity, obviously we're dealing with a more of a characteristic and, and defining it in terms of English language. And one of the reasons why I, I, I think we went back to, the, to our first roundtable on this, but I'll go ahead and I think uh, perhaps one of the things we could try to do by the end of the entire roundtable discussions is have a proper definition as, as we can try to, to discover through scripture. Uh, what I have so far is the traits, characteristics, and responsibilities that is unique to an adult human male. Um, so, like, in in because we're not just dealing with good humans, because everyone should, be, and that's one of the things we should. There, there's a responsibility that, that women have to God. So it's not just being responsible. It's not just being and having integrity. It's not just about working hard. There, there has to there. There are distinctions I believe that are clear within Scripture that is unique. To adult human males, as opposed to boys, children, as opposed to women, and so being able to distinguish these things, I think, is a very valuable um, 
uh, resource for the question of the day. And again, I hate do, I hate doing this because we're always playing catch up, right? We're always responding to problems rather than getting ahead of them. But this is a problem we have within our society now that we don't know what masculinity is anymore, that they have attempted to try to define masculinity from a strictly biological standpoint. They've tried to define masculinity from a strictly uh, sociological standpoint, cultural standpoint, when in actuality, we should be able to define masculinity from the perspective of scripture. And so going through Genesis 1 and 2, going through Genesis 3, and of course, going all the way through the rest of scripture. What do we see as the God-ordained concept that is the difference? And I would well, say, based upon based upon the curse, and this is the question that's kind of standing out right now, <clears throat> based upon the curse, do we see that God had distinguished a difference between male and female? And I think it's really an interesting point that we haven't covered yet <clears throat> in our discussions, but bears notice, is that a woman is... A woman. I mean, Matt Walsh proved it for us, right? But, uh, <laughs> you don't, we don't. We talk about you know a, a woman versus a child, or versus a man, or versus a boy, or versus a girl, or whatever. Uh, but uh, and a young boy or a young girl. She's, it's a boy. It's a girl. They're a teen boy or a girl. Whatever. It's no big deal. But there is a reality in which masculinity is not simply a biological result. You're not a good man or a bad man, or you could be, but. Uh, we generally will only tend to use that real man language with masculinity. We don't say he's a real boy or a real girl very frequently. And we uh, only, in fact, when I hear people talk about real woman language, you know, kind of, <clears throat> it's always a sort of mockery or at least imitation of language that was always specifically related to men. And it, it's an important point because I don't think it's just cultural. I think it's a biblical ethic uh, or at least a biblically rooted ethic that you can fail as a man. Now, as a male, you're just biologically that. You can't fail as a biological male. It's just a description of what you are. But when it comes to masculinity, over and against any other sort of identification that we've talked about, there is a possibility, a potential, a, even a need and a desire, right? What does God do? He comes to, comes to someone and says, be a man. Answer me to Joe. Be a man, right? And obviously there's some some uh, humor, right, and the irony in that when, when God talks to Job. Uh, but even, you know, uh, the language surrounding uh, courage, right, is related to masculinity or manliness. And it's obvious that a person can be courageous or be cowardly, but the expectation is if you're going to be a real man, that courage, that's not not being afraid, but standing up to that fear is a part of the expectation of who you will be. And I think that's an important part of our discussion here and why it's so difficult to, to get a handle, because what we're asking is, is when has someone succeeded in those special roles as, uh, as a, a masculinity from a biblical perspective with the knowledge that you can fail at it? Again, you could be a good woman, you could have a, a woman be a good woman or a bad woman, perhaps, or potentially, but she's just a woman. She doesn't have to earn her femininity, but we do have to earn masculinity by how we choose to live. And so I could say about that, you know, shiftless layabout loser who's drunk on the couch, not caring for, not providing, not engaging, he's not a real man. The workaholic who goes so hard and goes and goes and goes into the paint, but doesn't engage, care for his wife and teach his wife, he's not a real man. He's not fulfilling the requirements that God has put upon and designed for masculinity. And I have no problem using that language. That they've yep. failed to be a real man. Their <clears throat> cowardice has overcome them. So from what you're saying, Brad, which I ascertain quite well, um, for a man to be a man, he has got to line up with biblical principles. Right. So yeah. getting back to Will, your definition is is almost, almost complete, but it's still there's a part of it that's incomplete. Do you mind reading it again? Uh, the traits, characteristics, responsibilities that is unique to the adult human males. According to the word of God. I think According to the word of God. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm exactly. just saying, we are talking about biblical masculinity, which differs, or or biblical manhood. I don't, you know, since I got so many stupid difficulties. Um, uh, it differs from what, what any other idea of manhood is, any other cult that comes up with manhood. If you've ever noticed when a cult doesn't have an ideal 
Jesus. They don't have an ideal manhood, which usually comes to um, something sexual. You know, like some of the cults have multiple wives. They're abusive to their women. The women are more doormats than than partnership. Um, I think something's required when God said he took Eve out of the side of a man that, that I think is unique as, as far as a partnership is concerned. Yet one is the head and one has to help the head. So I would say it's the neck. <laughs> my wife has to get my head straight sometimes. Um, but there is a, a, a part that is um, when we look biblically and uh, we have some really okay examples biblically of men, but we also have Jesus who is is a man, a human male. He chose to take on a human male body for a reason. He could have chose to do anything and he took a male body. He chose that the writers of scriptures were all males. So I think there's something quite unique that has to do with leadership, headship, directorship, love. Uh, a woman is a responder when a husband doesn't love her or his wife. He's not doing it. He's not being the male. Uh, she can't, if, if he's mad, she's not responding correctly. He's got the issue, you know, and, and that's what we often see. Um, I'm going to say something that's judgmental and my wife always gets on me, but I believe a lot of failed marriages that where men said, my wife had an affair, my wife ran off or my wife did this. He's got to look introspectively at, as his, at his job as being a biblical male. I don't know what else to say. Will marriages fail? Yes. But I think first stop is what did, where, where did I fail being a biblical male? Well, when the, when the uh, football team's losing, you fire the coach, right? <laughs> yeah. Sometimes to the chagrin of others, but. Uh, <laughs> uh, I wish the Cowboys had fired the general manager. <laughs> yeah. Well, but to your point um, too, Eric, because I, I yeah. absolutely agree. Well, I think what, what we run into is there's going to be some overlap with society or secular, if you want to call it, and their understanding of man, because they'll, they'll ascribe to leadership and those qualities. But I think the difference is biblically, we're called first and foremost to our family in the exercise of that leadership, where it's almost like these steps are skipped by the, the modern male, where it's, you know, go out and conquer, be a leader, be a man do this, do that. And it's like, no, no, no. Make sure your house is in order, right? That's the qualifications for someone who's leading a church. And so I think that's a well put statement, what you said. And, you know, I think that's where I see the issue is bypassing the biblical prescription for our responsibility of leadership right. and jumping to our own agenda. And, and okay. I could... Now I, do, I just, just, just to rein this in a little bit, because yeah, still have, still haven't answered the question. How did the curse to Adam, how, how did that help us understand biblical masculinity? Because the buck stopped with Adam. He, 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 there was no curse. When we talk about in Adamness, I don't know if that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a good clock. In Adamness, you look at the Bible uh, when it addresses humanity, we are all in Adam. We're not in Eve, we're in Adam. And I think that's an important uh, angle that we've got to look at. Because there's the, I, I I used to think it was funny when somebody would say, there's the first Adam and the second Adam. No, there's the first Adam and the last Adam. There's no need for any more because Adam, even <laughs> though he had a base start, he gave, he reflected to us the failure of man more than the success of man, where Christ being the last Adam showed nothing but the success of man and mankind, of course. Uh, and what we could get through that last Adam that we could not get, that we inherit from the first Adam. Let's put it that way, because we don't inherit uh, anything but baggage from the first Adam. And we've got to um, somehow climb out of that baggage by being in Christ, have a new relationship. So therefore, we could be that biblical male, if I'm making myself clear. Because once, you, once you're born, you're born with baggage. And you're basically kind of incompetent, right? Sure. And without mm -hmm. being complete in Christ, you know, I, I hate to be like this, but Mike and I were talking the other day, I don't know, quite a time ago. Um, I hate to counsel people that are not 
say it's it's a difficult it's because all you're really wanting to do is what give the gospel give the gospel because they can't connect with biblical um uh, i guess basically a matching a biblical lifestyle they can't do it so you you can make them the best secular person you can and they're still going to be a failure um well, it, for again lack of better understanding but that's that's where i'm at and to your your question will you know we've talked a lot about leadership i think leadership the effect of fall on leadership is kind of contained in verse 16 your desire shall be for your husband but what we see in the address to man seems to imply another element of our responsibility is not just leadership but provision it's our job to provide for the home whether that's provision for security provision for i think contextually it's quite clearly food you yeah. know sustenance and um it's interesting playing into how the jewish religious or a jewish wedding system develops the vows that the jewish male was giving to his wife one of those was to provide you know to be faithful but to provide for her needs and if that doesn't happen you know based on the way i see divorce and remarriage that was potentially a grounds for divorce. If they continually did not provide those things, then uh, Moses allows yeah, that. Yeah, Jacob, I, my, a thought came to my mind along those lines because God is called the, the great provider and he provided the lamb, the ram for uh, Abraham. And I think with the, with that idea of provision, it's there's a lot, man, you just open up, I'm going to use Pandora's box, but it's the wrong, really wrong analogy. But that's a loaded, that's an interesting conversation that I would love to have. Because God providing doesn't mean he's going to give you everything, but he will give you the necessities of everything. Um, so oh. what is a male, in accordance with that, what is a male to do if he is the provider of the family? Uh, yes, it is, I think, initially food the way it looks at. But I think it's a much bigger picture than that. So... It's, that's an interesting and that's right i mean yeah. i think that that provision and care going on through ultimately spiritual need is a big deal and i i just want to backstop this because we we'll, i'm sure talk about it later but <clears throat> recognize that this isn't suggesting that a woman is unable in a godly context to work outside of the home uh, we see very clearly right, right that in in proverbs 31 and, and us, <clears throat> that women are just as invested in the uh, financial success and and the you know professional success of the family so uh, i think what we're looking Looking at is a masculine versus feminine focus in terms of what they prioritize in their role. So here the wife is seemingly meant to prioritize and be the representative within the relationship of the family relationship for the kids and so on and so forth. And the husband is meant to be the one whose primary concern or, or takes full final responsibility for the uh, the outward provision of the family and so on and so forth, providing leadership. And, and again, I think we can easily make that jump into uh, that there is no such thing uh, as a meaningful leadership apart from spiritual leadership, apart from someone who's going to point his family towards Christ first and foremost. So, of course, there are situations where maybe the the, the wife, especially in today's world, the wife out earns the man. So it just makes the most sense, right, for her to to to, to go to work in that context. And and maybe there is a, sort of a, a reshuffle. But even within the context of those relationships, at least the successful ones that I've seen. There's still a reality that the husband is looking to the provision and protection and spiritual leadership of the family, and the wife is still, even though she might not be you know, in the home as much because of that situation, she is still the one who's advocating for the care of the children. And so, so anyway, I guess I just wanted to make it very clear, at least from my stance, you guys don't have to agree, but <clears throat> while we look at this picture of basic gender roles within the context of biblical masculinity, we don't want to uh, passively affirm some false notion that the only way a family works is if the if the husband's the one out earning all the bread and the wife's the one, you know, uh, not earning the bread. <laughs> yeah, but with what you said, Brad, yeah, but with, with what you said, Brad, that makes an interesting conversation also because the male is the provider, no matter if he's making the physical um money or wherewithal to 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 support the family and the wife's doing it but then we have to work actively within our roles as men and women to still do those roles 
and so it's kind of a kind of a mixed bag that you'll have and you've got to overcome that just because i'm making more money to you doesn't mean i'm providing i'm caring yeah you know yeah. and just because i'm not making the money you're making or i'm staying at home and mr mom doesn't mean i'm not providing right so yeah. that's that's an interesting <laughs> And I would even say that at, at the end of that, too, is that if there's a situation in which there's not money coming in the house, there's not food in the house, the husband can go, well, wife, you're not you're not doing your job. Right. He goes, right. he goes, he goes, if she lost her job and or she was, you know, just what happened, whatever happened, then he goes, well, then I need to I need to take on that responsibility. And if there's a if there's one person that has to go, has to go do it. it, it the biblical mandate seems to be. I think we can go ahead and ask this question seems to be the priority is that of the husband for the family to make sure that there is food and shelter. If we have mm -hmm. food and we have shelter with that, we should be content. So therefore <clears throat> that seems to be the, the responsibility of, of the husbands, of the fathers, of the males. Well, and I go a step further and say that every, that is ultimately the headship of what the man is taught male is talking about. If mm -hmm. there's a lack of love, if there's, if there's conflict, if there's sin, if there's a drug problem, it's all his problem, right? It's all yeah. the, 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 that is that final responsibility. And I think it's an important point that we, we have to note is that the, the worldly idea of what responsibility looks like uh, is so false, right? Oh, the husband, he's in charge. So you're saying he gets what he wants. No. I mean, if he's leading biblically, he may never get what he wants. He's always right. going to be making the sacrifice of his time and his. And this is the real tragedy of the satanic attack upon the family in the modern era is to suggest that somehow his leaving the house to go provide whatever that means is somehow more fulfilling than what's going on within the house. And so that the wife should also seek that same fulfillment. But really what we see in a biblical picture is that everything that's going on in that house is what's fulfilling. Everything that's going on in the house is what's important. Everything that's going on in the house is what's valuable. So the man goes out and leaves what is valuable to go get more stuff to continue that valuable, wonderful, God-created institution. And what does Satan do? Well, he tells women, nah, that homemaker thing, that's not a high enough calling for you. You need to go out and make some bucks or stand on top of a board. And, and men, have, I think it's kind of an interesting thing because now we see men going passive going, yeah, I'll be your, you know your your arm candy or whatever it is because it's not fulfilling work is not fun it's not i mean and it, we all are pastors so we get to teach the word of god and we do get a lot of fulfillment but there's a lot of people who go out there to these daily grinds where they hate every moment and every moment is hollow and it stinks and it's degrading in the deepest sense possible as you go out there and uh yeah <laughs> have to do what you have to do to survive whenever disgusting worldly environment that you need to go to in order to provide for your family and to pretend like somehow that's an ideal or that's a wish fulfillment or that's better than looking at your babies and bringing them up in the grace and knowledge of the Lord is so far beyond absurd. It's flipped on its head. It's, it's wild, and it shows why the feminists have to lie so fully and degrade and denigrate the truth with such completeness because, as was said by a famous feminist of the past, we can't give them an option to stay at home because if they have the option, everyone's going to choose to do that because it's a better way to live. They know it. And yet, because they're motivated entirely satanically, they are absolutely going to forfeit all truth in order to come to this ultimate end of seeing what God made good degraded and destroyed go ahead, jacob <clears throat> yeah I, I think those are excellent points and it, it kind of makes me think of conversations i've had with my wife and she's endorsed my my thought so i'm not just speaking from my male perspective but it seems like god has obviously made women and men different and one of the things i've thought about is as a man we typically are a little bit more linear you know in our focus we're able to analyze something step by step move it that gets us into problems when our wife is having you know distress and we try to solve it right well they don't necessarily want it solved they just want it heard so you know those types of elements come into play and so with what you're saying with that daily grind and maybe we could even say our responsibility god has made us thus to for the task now i think the the day the grind part of that daily labor is exactly what we're talking about as a result of the fall. That's why it's hard. But but again, 
I think that's what plays into who we are and how we're made in the image of God as a male, you know, being able to, one of the things I've expressed to our church and my wife is I have like a nothing box where I could just all my days, anxieties, it's just on my bedside table and I'm out in 30 seconds. My wife doesn't have that. And I need to sometimes in, in living with my wife in an understanding way, help her unload those worries. And so, but anyways, all that to say, I think that's what plays into who we are as a man. Now it gets a little bit psychological. So we need Luther here to correct uh, any of my wrong thinking, but. <clears throat> I agree with you though, that there is that within the actual discourse that we've been having focus in on these things obviously we're jumping ahead of a few things because obviously we'll be talking more about these things as they come up but even just in, simply in genesis and i think we can close on this point here um i'll i'll, I'll go ahead and give everybody, everybody one more opportunity to discuss this but based upon genesis 1 and 2 and what he told adam versus what he told eve based upon what happened in chapter 3 and dealing with the sin in the fall that there was a failure to, to the woman and there was a sin against God. In the curse itself, we see a distinction, not just because of the, the, the actual activity of the sin, the deceive and the rebellion, but also because of the specific gender roles that God had placed. That there was, there is, there is a responsibility of, of the woman in dealing with the family. And there is now, due to the curse, a responsibility of the man to go and work and provide for his family. It does, I, 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 like Brad said, it doesn't mean that the woman can't, but the ultimate responsibility to provide for his family falls upon the man. So um, I think we're making good headway. I think that the com combination of the three, the three uh, uh, round tables we've had so far, I think has allowed us to be able to have some development understanding. Obviously we don't have the, all the biblical mandates, um, all of the uh, examples that we could find throughout scripture of good men and what they did. And obviously, as, as always, a good Christology will always bring us to great, to, to good biblical humanity and biblical masculinity, you know, understanding what God did in as a man. And we'll, and again, we'll talk more about that as we kind of move forward, looking at uh, the, the book as, as a whole. So um, with that, does uh, anybody want to have any last words as to this particular content? I, while it's fresh, I just wanted to say in light of what Brad's saying, first of all, I appreciate it because anyone listening to this, I never want to give the impression that you're sinning because we live in an economically difficult time that mm -hmm. most households have to have dual income. So mm -hmm. you're not sinning with that. But with that, it's going to look different depending on your relationship with your wife. And that's where I know this is kind of a component of biblical femininity, but the help meet concept, they are a helper. And so as man and woman come together in marriage, that's where discussion is. You know, the man might say, you know what, I am perfectly suited to go out and work this welding job or this truck driving job or this teaching job or doctor job, whatever it is, you know, or if pastor. you could... Yeah, or pastor, or, or <laughs> you know, you stay home, take care of the kids. But even that, I think the the training of the children, wouldn't that also be our responsibility as men? And it so within, of course. within our responsibilities, the woman is our help me. And, you know, it's our job, I think, to help them help us by communicating and, you know, just working out what works in our relationship. And that might look different. You know, once once we get to that point in dealing with the uh, the marriage role specifically, when we get to Ephesians and whatnot, I do have some specific kind of uh, different thoughts on what the marriage responsibility and roles look like. <clears throat> but we'll get there. And I think, but I think that's a very good point. Is that there's nothing outside the family. There's nothing. I'm sorry. There's nothing in the family that happens within those walls. Dealing with the wife, dealing with the children, provisions, anything like that. That is not part of our responsibility. There's not a division of responsibility. It's a unity of responsibility. Although the 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 who takes the lead in those roles may change a little bit. Um, but overall, and this is where I think is is uh, is has to be made 
um, is that the 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 buck stops with the husband when it comes down to the to the to the uh, responsibilities of the family. The husband can't say, according to scripture, and not only where we are in Genesis, but also what we'll find later on, that oh, that was the wife's fault. No, it's it all reflects back on the husband first when it, the responsibility to God. And so therefore, we should be in agreement so that we should be working as one so that I fulfill my responsibility to the best of my ability. When it comes down to, to the secular feminism and secular masculinity concepts, they seem to want, they think that responsibility means they, again, as Brad put, gets their way. But it's not about getting your way. It's about taking responsibility. And unfortunately, I think a lot of men most men, even in Christian churches, don't want to take the responsibility, and that's the big issue. And so, therefore, they go, "Well, I'll give up the authority because I don't want the responsibility." And and we'll talk about authority when it comes up. I don't think authority is understood properly either, but we'll we'll definitely get to that as we move forward to the future.